Welcome to lectures and interviews about leadership for sustainability. I'm Bruce Hall. In this session, I want to talk about the myth of balanced nature. It's likely to challenge some of your preconceptions, and I know from firsthand experience that it irritates my colleagues in conservation biology and restoration ecology. But the bottom line is that nature is dynamic, not balanced. There's no idealized condition that science can tell us what we should sustain. Science and scientific concepts like biodiversity or ecological health cannot tell us which nature to sustain. For that, we have to invoke values. Just to remind you, you're likely not alone. According to the sustainability values diagnostic you took, most people believe in a balanced nature. Probably the best way to unpack this is to begin with an example. Consider two very different types of forest. The one on the left is an old growth wilderness. The one on the right is a forest plantation planted by humans. Which one of these is the best ecological health? Which one is healthier and better? As you might imagine, this is a bit of a trick question, so think carefully about your answers. Pause and then come back. The answer that I want to defend here is that they are both e healthy. They both have health as defined by science. The one on the left, the science would be conservation biology or restoration ecology. The one on the right, the plantation, would be timber management and forest management. That is, the science of conservation biology would say that the old growth forest where things are very biodiverse, there's nothing but native species, everything is go growing slowly, there's a fair bit of decay within species, there's a lot of diversity in age as well as species, as well as where things are planted, that's the definition of ecological health. Whereas the forest on the right, which is planted by humans in straight rows with very disease-resistant, genetically engineered species, probably all exactly clones of each other, are young and growing very quickly. Each individual is extremely healthy. Each individual tree has a maximum amount of space for light and air and water that it needs. It's protected by humans against fire and against pests. Whereas the old growth forest, the individuals are old, many of them, they're decaying, they're unhealthy, they're going to fall and die and rot, and they're full of disease and insects. So which, which one is, is actually healthier? I mean, both have scientists that defend what is ecological health, but those definitions are based upon different outcomes. The one on the right, the plantation forest, is healthy in terms of preserving soil and, and producing the most wood, the most economic value, as quickly as possible. Whereas the old growth forest is healthy in terms of how it resembles a condition of 1491 or something untrammeled or untouched by humans. Now, you could argue that the plantation's health requires human intervention. That is, it requires humans to plant it, to fertilize it, to water it, to protect it from fire. But that doesn't mean it's unhealthy. It just means it requires inputs from humans. Some of you are no doubt confused or frustrated by this example, but please bear with me. What I want to do is, in the next couple minutes, explain why these concepts in red are so difficult to defend just based on science. They require us to invoke values, human values, for which conditions we want to sustain. Let me reintroduce you to the concept of geological time. This diagram graphs out the 4.5 billion years of history of changing conditions in the environment. Which of these environmental conditions is healthy? Which one is the best for you? for us, for biodiversity. Are the healthy ecological conditions the ones that started at 4.5 billion years ago? Or how about a couple of billion years ago when single cells were alive? Or how about up in the Jurassic period where dinosaurs roamed the earth? Or perhaps it was just 5 million years ago when humans descended and first started walking earth. Or maybe it was 200,000 years ago when modern humans equivalent in every way to us, were walking the earth. Or perhaps it's 
just now when there's agriculture and iPhones and automobiles and beer and university football teams? Which of these conditions of nature is the right biodiversity, the right ecological health, the right ecological integrity? Which one should we live in? It's not a question science can answer. And as a result, some of these terms are just really difficult to defend without invoking values. Let me explain this a different way by contrasting two very different mental models that people hold about how nature works. One model is that nature or ecosystems or the biosphere is a whole. It's like an organism. It's like a person. It's got its own temperature. It's got its own necessary inputs and outputs. We know when it's healthy because it's eating right, it's exercising right, it's got the right temperature. We, we have a clear definition of health. All the parts are there. Whereas the other model is the mechanistic or machine. It's like a car. You can change the parts. You can add different tires. You can make it a different color. You can make it faster. You can make it cheaper. You can make it safer. It, 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 it's whatever you want it to be. Those parts can be reassembled into another car, creating another output. They're all equally good. They just have different values. The condition in between is Frankenstein. And this is where we're really uncomfortable. If you start replacing parts of the person, you start replacing their eyes, you start replacing their arms, their liver, their kidney, their brain, they become something else. They become something that's not natural. It's, it's not right. It is Frankenstein. Now, if we return to this example, the old growth wilderness is the whole. It's the organism. All the parts are just right. They're natural. They belong there. There's no artificiality. Whereas the plantation is the machine. All the parts have been changed. The water's changed. The fertilizer's changed. The, the biocides that control the past, even the species themselves perhaps are genetically modified. Everything's determined by human. But it doesn't make it less, less healthy or wrong. It just makes it different. It's producing different outcomes. In fact, arguably, it's producing the wood that we use for building and paper, making it very efficiently so that the more plantations we have, we actually aren't harvesting or harming the biodiversity in the old growth. So from some larger perspective, we could say that the plantation is actually helping the old growth. So in order to decide which biodiversity or ecological condition is the healthiest or the right one requires us to first specify the values or outcomes that people want. Science by itself can't make that decision. Now at the risk of really irritating some people, I want to take on the sacred cow of native versus exotic species. You'll see the logic is very similar. So pause for a minute and give me some reasons why native species are better than exotic or if they're not. If we return to this holistic versus mechanistic model, it helps explain things. Under the holistic model, the composition really matters. You have to have the original parts. You have to have the native species, something that hasn't been introduced or artificialized by humans. Whereas if you have a mechanistic worldview of, of nature, then all that matters is what function they serve. How does it make it faster, safer, or cheaper, or sexier, whatever we want. As long it's the outcome that matters. It's the function that the species provides that that we that we care about under the mechanistic model. So continuing this logic, you can see that an exotic species isn't bad in and of itself. It depends on what functions it serves. If it replaces the functions that a native species provides, if it stabilizes the climate, if it provides us with food, if it circulates nutrients, if it absorbs carbon dioxide, whatever it is we want, so cleans the soil, cleans the water. The species in these pictures are all exotic. We, and we things we like, that we need. We, need, we eat wheat and apples and honey, and we need the honeybee to pollinate all our crops. These are good. They're not bad. They provide good functions. Yes, some exotic alien species are bad. The gypsy moth, the zebra mussel, kudzu. These are not bad because they're alien or exotic. They're bad because they're invasive, because they're changing the landscape. Nothing that I'm saying is condoning exotic or alien or an invasive species. I'm just making the point that we can't 
critique them just because they're not natural, just because they're not native. That's an arbitrary and capricious explanation. There are lots of good reasons why exotic, alien, invasive species cause problems and billions of dollars of damage to ecosystems and to people and to places. When we're arguing about sustainable development, what to sustain, what to develop, let's invoke values. Let's be honest about what we're arguing about. Safety, security, health, beauty, history, prosperity, identity. These are the things we're arguing about. Let's not confuse and conflate the issues with terms that don't have meaning. Remember that we're just talking through topics in this book. Next up, if you have the stomach for it, is evolution.